Welcome to Cool Up Conversations, the podcast where impactful discussions serve as catalysts for change. I'm your host, Sabrina Hanna, and this podcast is dedicated to advocacy and the individuals driving positive transformation in the Canadian healthcare landscape. In this episode, we are speaking with Keith McIntosh, Chair of the Advocacy for Child Canadian Childhood Oncology Research Network, ACORN, if you've seen that abbreviation. ACORN was founded in 2014 to advocate for translational research and effective treatments to support the goal of curing childhood, adolescent, and young adult cancers. It is made up of parents from across Canada who have children with different types of cancer and the desire to help improve pediatric oncology research. Keith also has 20 years of experience of policy work in Ottawa, 12 of those in healthcare, and part of his work was working with patient groups to help understand the regulatory system from the industry perspective, and then ended up on the other side of the desk. And so, Keith, you're on the episode today because February 15th is International Childhood Cancer Day. And let's start by you telling us why it's important to raise awareness about pediatric cancer. It's important because it's, despite how much energy and attention it it sort of has, it's a a topic and a subject that captures attention. Uh, Certainly, it is, um, uh, it generates a lot of, uh, funds uh, collected, you know, smiling, smiling bald children to raise funds for uh, cancer uh, research. Uh, it it still is sort of a thumb on the on the hand, and and it stands apart. Care for children with can- cancer stands apart from what we think about the cancer cancer care system. It it isn't really a part of it at all. It's it's and and depending on which province you live in. Uh, in Canada, uh, the kind of care and 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 how far you might have to travel to get that care um, isn't the same kind of experience that that adults have or that we we have um, uh, with with the adult space. And so, and the reality is is that that for a lot of uh, children, the the treatment options are uh, either brutal or um, non or and in some cases non-existent. So. So we need better treatments. We need um, uh, more treatments, more access to research, and 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 better outcomes for for these kids. Yeah, that's actually a really great point to make. That you know, you we see a lot of you know, like the sick kids ads, or you know, the bald kids that are smiling and thank you for for donating but actually we we never really understand the other side of that where you know they're not getting the treatment that they deserve and the treatments that they are getting are really toxic so like how do we how do we change that conversation like how do we bring that to the forefront it's not just about giving money for I guess I mean it is going to research but how do we say like that's that's just not enough because these kids across Canada are not getting access to the drugs that they need. Yeah, the, the unfortunately a small portion, a very small portion of total uh, cancer research dollars are dedicated to pediatric or or um, adolescent young adult uh, cancer patients. Um, the kinds of cancers that children get and children um, die from are different from uh, and and diff- and the proportions are different from adults. Yes, the research uh, that's conducted in in adult cancers eventually translates uh, to to therapies and care for children. Um, but we're talking years and decades uh, for that translation to happen uh, and it needs to be quicker and it and we need more, more dedicated um, research and and attention on um, on these cancers, particularly the ones that that don't have good options uh, for 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 treatment. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that it like translates into the pediatric cancers. So does that mean they're looking at the drugs in the adult population and then like just diminishing the dose or whatever? so that it's appropriate in the pediatric population? Like, yeah, what does well, it mean so, to translate into the pediatric? Well, well, that's just it. Um, and there are kind of three buckets, three groupings, if you, if you want. There are those cancers that occur in children uh, that also occur in adults. And so the, the, 
care and the therapies and and um, the research are are highly applicable, uh, right? And so the goal there is to make sure that the um, the research, the clinical trials happen both in the adult and pediatric populations. Um, the outcomes can sometimes be different and and success rates can sometimes be different. There's an ex a recent example where where the success uh, in the pediatric case was much better than in the adult population. So there's that that's one case where it's essentially the same disease. There are other cases where where um, molecular uh, genomic genomic markers or or molecular pathways are driving different cancers in in adults and in in children. So drugs that are targeted to these genomic differences are being used for different cancers in in children uh, or or other young people, but they're not the same 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 tumor location or, or or disease. And then third, there are there are pediatric diseases that have no analogs in the adult space, and so they're they're um, standalone, right, and require dedicated research, dedicated um, science on on the origins and what's driving those cancers and then therapy. So those, of course, would be the most difficult to to target. But in the, the reality is, is in, in each of those cases. Developing the new therapies is is harder and the they're really an afterthought in terms of uh, of of the the system, if you want, in terms of getting access to therapies. And so so we're running into situations where um, there really is a gap in terms of of what's available as therapies, even if they've come along um, in development. You you there are so many things that you said in that in that explanation that I, I want to ask about, but I'm I'm going to start with this one. So it sounds to me like there is a need for pediatric specific clinical trials. Is that actually happening right now? So, yes, they are. Um, there aren't enough. And they're not in enough places. Um, Right. So I talked about about the care care model. Um, uh, cancer care in Canada for children and, and adolescents is generally limited to um, the tertiary children's hospitals in the various in the various provinces. Um, some satellite locations and some some uh, care can happen in 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 those satellites, but by and large, you're traveling to the tertiary uh, children's hospital. And depending on the province and depending on the hospital, uh, right, they have to go through the process of opening up each and every trial. Uh, and they then they have resources for only so many. So you're when when they open a trial, they're hoping that the right children walk through the door. Um, right. So. They can't open each trial that may be available and maybe maybe running, um, but matching and then matching which which ones are open, where and to the families that that wind up at the hospital don't always don't always line up. So that there's an idea of improving the access to trials by either moving the kid to the trial wherever it may may be, uh, or making sure that that trials are more portable. So that so that they can get it where closer to home. And so when you talk about the gaps in pediatric cancer and you're talking about, you know, like them as an afterthought and getting access to therapies. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Can you like give us an, a better understanding of what those gaps are? Yeah, so. You know, in some cases, the the treatment and the standard protocols are pretty straightforward and are 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 well established. And and you know, in my son's case, the the newest drug that he had of a, of three was was approved in 1978. 
<laughs> so, and and none of the three, none of the three are approved for use in children, and none of the three are approved for use to treat um, CNS tumors. Um, but access to those drugs isn't complicated or difficult because they're old and well established, and they're cheap. <laughs> so, you know that kind of access is not an issue. Um, we have the benefit of I talked about the the uh, genomic markers and the and the, the pathways right and the those targeted drugs that have come on on online and are 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 well used in adult populations um, for you know five ten approaching twenty years for some of them um, in the cases where those drugs were developed for a, a signaling pathway in, in adult cancers, right? They came on market, they went through the approval and the evaluation process at the time that they entered the marketplace. Subsequent academic research identified the, those pathways in pediatric use and, I, and, and the benefits and, and, and developed standards of care and high levels of, of evidence of efficacy but now they kind of stand alone and there's no way to loop them back into the system. They went through the pathway 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and getting it now back through the system, um, there's no mechanism for that, right? And so there are, we're now looking at approaching 50 drugs or more that are kind of in this limbo um, and hundreds of kids over the last five years or more that that have had these kinds of quest access questions. Um, there's a, a pharmacist at SickKids who's who's partly part part of the role is a is a drug access navigator um, and a network of and there's a network of pharmacists across those tertiary hospitals working on those those access questions because the the drugs and the evidence is there uh, on use uh, in some cases standard of care developed through the um through the 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 networks of of pediatric oncologists but the but the access loops don't exist so what uh we need to find ways to 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 bring those back into the loop yeah, when you're prescribing a 50-year-old or almost 50-year-old medication to a child with cancer today, that is like a flagrant afterthought in 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 the whole system. I mean, I I can't imagine that the medicines that were developed 50 years ago are as I don't want to say as effective, but they probably come with a lot more side effects than the treatments that are coming today. They're very effective at what they they do, um, but they're they're pretty brutal. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. And so, when you talk about the mechanism, is there like a process within HTA for these pediatric drugs? I, I'm saying pediatric, but they're actually not really pediatric drugs. But is yeah, there a mechanism? Well, in, in, there was a case last year where uh, the the POGO, which is a, an organization, uh, the uh, Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, um, they they in fact submitted a a non-sponsor uh, submission for a drug that was effect essentially in this in these, this circumstance. So they had to generate the evidence. They had to to generate the um, the HTA package to submit to CADA uh, to run through the PCOTA process, based on academic uh, academic trials, academic research that was designed to demonstrate uh, efficacy and safety. Um, so. And there's been a there's been a positive recommendation out of that process, which is which is great, right? Because it it's, shows that there is a there is some pathway. Um, it was a challenge and it was a lot of work. And 
now what? <laughs> the product the product became uh, generic at roughly the same time that this uh, that this CADF recommendation came out. Um, so there's a you know there are a couple of generic uh, filings for for the product, but um, it, that tells you the timelines that we're looking at. And so, if it's not an industry sponsored trial, like I, I'm just so these these clinicians in Ontario had to do something specific. Like they had to run a clinical trial to get the evidence that they needed to go through the HTA process. Yeah, well, well, they ran the trial. They they ran the trials for to use the drug, right? The most many um, many children uh, only get access to therapy via clinical trial, um, and so these academic clinical trials are. Are really the um, the foundation of of all uh, virtually all of the protocols and treatment um, protocols for for children, um, and so making sure that 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 the the clinical trials can happen and be open in as many hospitals as possible. Uh, that that's really really the reason, um, and so and the and that's why moving kids around and, and moving kids to trials uh, is such a big deal and why organize there are organizations that both um, connect families to trials but also support that travel right the provinces the provincial uh, health systems generally don't provide any supports for either the either travel or um, and, and and supported care uh, can be a challenge too so and then there also wouldn't be what you see in the adult populations, which is the patient support programs. Yes, and so getting access to the drugs in the context of trials um, uh, is an, uh, is another question: is is can the, can the company uh, provide access to those drugs? Is it is it on the is it does it happen to be on the formulary? Will the province cover it? That like that's a that's a question often um, that has to be addressed. Yeah, and so that's when the patient access navigator or the drug navigator becomes really important. Yeah. And I, but I have a question about so this is a Pogo, I guess, sponsored um, application that went through CADIF. And so does that mean that it is now? Well, it went through review, and if it's accepted, and I I don't know, does it go through a reimbursement process? And then like, what happens? Like, does everybody across Canada except Quebec have access to it? And if those in Quebec, how would they get access to it? Do they have to go to Ontario well, to well, get the, it? There is, there is no clear path. There is a there is no clear now what. Um, the <laughs> PCPA is certainly not designed to pick up a non-sponsored uh, product. Run, it's sort of odd, an odd thing to think about putting a generic product through the innovative product pathway because it just had a it just had a new indication recommendation through CADF. It's not PCPA is not really the vehicle for that. So the the steps really then becomes going to each of the provinces. Uh, and and getting it onto the formulary for that indication, um, yeah, as needed. And so, who who's responsible for doing that? Well, that that that's a effectively a clinician thing, or so or clinicians a would thing. have to go like ask their hospital to ask to have it on the formulary. More or less. Yeah. Okay. Sounds complicated. Yeah. Well, even even after all of that. Uh, yeah, it's complicated. So another thing that I, I really would like to talk about is um, in 2001, in the federal budget, there was some uh, resources allocated for the creation of a Canadian Pediatric Cancer Consortium. Did I? I got that right. The CPCC. Yeah. Do you do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, 
so that's ex that's a really exciting development, right? You we talked about paying attention. We've talked about about making sure that there was was uh, a, a vehicle, a venue, and and um, that it's it requires some some attention. Uh, federal government provided thirty million dollars for cancer for pediatric cancer research. Twenty three of it was earmarked to this consortium. Recently cha name changed to ACCESS, um, which is an acronym. And I apologize, I don't have it handy. Um, but that $23 million was built and designed to build this consortium as a vehicle and a, and a, and a, a venue for addressing the the access and care pathway nose to tail um, and with some infrastructure and some capacity and some resourcing to be a hub for discussing and 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 developing policy and supporting research uh, from basic biology to clinical trials improving access to therapies looking at the regulatory system the, the research ethics uh, and privacy issues as well as knowledge translation. Um, so that's very exciting. That money and that announcement in the federal budget came out of advocacy. It was, it was, and ACORN was involved, um, organization called Helena's Hope was, was heavily involved and, and active. It included clinicians, it included uh, researchers, uh, but it really was the voice of, of families and of um, children with cancer who spoke to um, federal politicians and drove that funding. So it, it was patient advocacy and family advocacy that 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 brought that money to reality. Um, and it was it was the advocacy community that brought the clinicians and the researchers together. Um, so and helped define and, and set a vision uh, for the org for the organization to say it is possible, even if it was only two years and even if it was only twenty three million dollars to identify a vision and to um, to to chart a path and say and say we want to take a bite of of each of these apples and and try to try to move these things along um, and and patients and families have been built into uh, each of the pieces of the matrix and um, it's it's been quite quite um, rewarding to work uh, with the group and and to to have the the patient and the advocate voice um, really embedded in in the system what in fact this was a a, res a CIHR research grant that had one proposal submitted um, from effectively the entire community of, of pediatric clinicians and researchers across the country um, with patients as uh, included as, a, as a, a, a P, one of the PIs. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, it was one submission for the proposal, which is, uh, uh, or for the call for, for proposals, which is not common at the very least. Absolutely not common. So ACCESS is Advancing Childhood Cancer Experience, Science and Survivorship. And it's also ACCESS in French, which is Agir contre le cancer des enfants avec succès. Like, great that they were able to keep the same acronym in English yes. and in French. And they're so, so they're building their web presence. Uh, so so that uh, will be more accessible, um, if you pardon the pun, uh, over the coming weeks. <laughs> So you, there are a couple of things that are really interesting. I think you said thirty million. Yes, yeah, seven. Seven was dedicated to a couple of other CIHR research grants focused on pediatric um, cancer, but the bulk of that thirty was was dedicated to the to the consortium idea. Yeah, and so it sounds like they're they're using this to uncomplicate the pediatric cancer space. Well, to at least. Put it all in one place with with resources. I would. Yeah. It, yeah. 
uncomplicated is probably uh, yeah, wishful. too strong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably wishful. What I find really interesting is the fact that there was just the one application and it was the whole community that came together. Um, it it well it's it, it's tied to the size of the community. Um, that it's it's large enough to you know accomplish to bring together resources to bear to to network and to work together both both within Canada but also internationally. Um, but it's small enough that it's possible to know virtually everybody. Um, so the there are absolutely networks of um, clinicians and researchers who who you know are focused on blood cancers or CNS tumors or um, solid tumors, right? Have their special their areas of specialty. Um, but at the same time, in the smaller centers. Right, that the the oncologists are the oncologist, um, and so they will will be treating whichever families walk through the door, um, and won't have have the the same degree of specialization, um, and uh, so and that's just the reality of the of the community. So so there are um, definitely the networks that exist, but there's also um cross pollination and 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 the ability to work together which is which was um uh, quite important i think for that for that to come together and it was all about that this was creating something new the, the building the consortium it wasn't about adding on incrementally to existing projects but to build something new that was overarching Right, the same kinds of policy issues, the same kinds of access issues, the same kinds of of um, needs tied to clinical trials and biology research, really are cross cutting, um, and so so the that really drove and motivated a lot of the a lot of the work. And so within Canada, we do also have a pediatric cancer network. Yeah. Um. C17. Yeah, C17 is an organization of each of the representing each of those the tertiary hospitals mm -hmm. and um, coordinates provides quite a, quite a bit of, of centralization for um, supporting the opening of clinical trials and supporting clinical research uh, as well as a venue for for um, for discussing the, those issues and, and with with the goal of supporting uh, supporting research and clinical trials. There's this this coming together of the clinicians and the researchers working with the advocates to move things along in pediatrics. Like, tell me a little bit about that. Well, yeah, and and that's another piece that's that's certainly different, I think, from the experience um, working in in the in the adult world. Um, Dealing and working with with children with cancer is is can have a profound impact on you and the, having that experience and it, and the other thing is that there there's a big void and, and big gaps to fill which require a lot of work and so the clinicians and researchers are answering quest are actively answering questions for how to treat these children constantly. And so, and identifying what the research questions are, what the patient needs are, and filling those gaps is very much, it involves everybody. And so the, the clinicians and the researchers are closer to, or seem to be closer to the, the, those things that are needed to be answered than may otherwise be the case in in other kinds of, of um, uh, cancer care. And so it, it's a there's a, a community effort, um, whether it's the children's oncology group, the COG or or PSYOP, which is the global 
uh, organization or C17, um, then that's sort of everybody's rolling up their sleeves and trying to get trying to get um, to financers. And and to move the needle on something which is really quite technical, right? You need the voice of the clinicians who are they're the ones whose voice is going to carry the weight on what the science says. Um, uh, but it's it's the families that they <laughs> that they look to, to to carry a voice of why it's important um, and and what's important in all of this. And so being able to carry the, the those messages together is is, is impactful. And so how do you use those voices to make a difference? And I mean, you know, you we were talking last week and you were telling me how there are only three or four provincial cancer plans that include uh, a pediatric strategy. So how do you use those voices to like to change that? Yeah, well, I think we now have the benefit of of the consortium. Uh, we now have the benefit of access and having a venue and having uh, resources to 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 put put a cohesive and a comprehensive voice together. Um, there is a significant, you know, many many families who experience childhood cancer, uh, you know, turn around and and develop or or create an organ, create something. As a as a new beginning, or a, to to do something with that experience, um, mostly motivated by the idea of making it better for the next family, really is, is sort of really the driver. Most of that work, um, most of the organizations founded um, to support and to work in in supporting families with with children with cancer, are focused on research, focused on um, services for families undergoing active treatment, supports for clinical trials, you, you know, that, that we talked about getting to trials or, or all of those, those things in terms of services, um, or psychosocial supports for, for the kids or the, or the families. Most of, very few um, focus on policy issues or access issues. <laughs> For a long time, there was nothing, no access to to seek out. So, uh, you know, the research is getting access. Um, we are now at a place where there are enough um, access questions to, to to therapies that that we really need to be turning turning some attention to to uh, to those policy questions and and. And how to get how to get access to these these therapies that are really becoming standard of care or have high levels of evidence, um, but you know ha haven't fit through the right uh, uh, the right pathway. Standard of care in other jurisdictions, not in Canada. Well, and well, as best best uh, best care possible. Um, uh, by yeah, with a, with with guidelines from from Cog or uh, approaching standard of care, just not on just not on formulary. Right. So there are other jurisdictions that are that are trying to change the pediatric uh, therapeutic space, and like there's uh, in the U.S. and in the EU. Do you want to? I mean, as far as I know, that's still not happening in Canada. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, so there is an or, uh, there are a number of organizations. So the the regulators in Europe and and kind of the U.S. FDA and and EMA are are actively pursuing pediatric pathways. Health Canada's on doing similar work with with uh, improving um, and 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 pushing for pediatric approvals where and and evidence generation. Um, the there is an organization uh, called Accelerate 
that's that brings together industry and clinicians and researchers and the uh, regulatory uh, regulator community to discuss exactly those questions on uh, on designing the science, designing trials for approval and and to get to get the evidence needed um, specifically to support uh, to support those um, those products and 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 to bring products to to market for for pediatric uh, cancers specifically. Um, there, like, what I think is nobody's doing it right yet. <laughs> um, I think there's a there's a growing amount of attention to the to the questions, and there are you know there are companies who are are including pediatric uh, trials and pediatric components to their trials at as early as as uh, the adult indications that is occurring. Um, I'm not sure that those products get <laughs> wind up with access any better um, than than products that haven't been been included at the uh, as, at early stages. Um, but I think there, I think things are you know it's encouraging. There is, I think now we have enough tangible products and enough enough tangible examples to identify where where the current system falls down or doesn't doesn't um, really doesn't allow these products to come through um, and and there's enough interest or at least growing interest in having conversations about creative ways of of making sure that these these don't stay um, stay stay the way they are conversations with who well you know following the the the, um, the at the Cadeth symposium a year ago, there was a there was a session um, that discussed access to these these specific access issues in terms of of the kinds of things that are that are going on in in um, with with newer therapies and trying to get them um, onto formulary for for access. And so those conversations are, are happening. I think there is a yeah, Health Canada has the pediatric drug uh, drug um, strategy and and is and is working actively on a number of of um, files to improve access to pediatric indications. Um, and I think Cadis is has has uh, is the door is open there. I think to to discuss uh, these issues and to find creative ways. I think that I think there's there's room there. Um, what about from the industry perspective? I think that's a key. That's a key conversation that we need to be having more. Um, like I said, there's some of the companies are including the pediatric studies as kind of as normal course. Others um, less so. Um, but I don't know that it's it's. Uh, uh, I don't know that it's a decision that they simply don't want to. It's just not the immediate pathway. Um, so what what at, from an access point of view, the, the from the consortium, involving industry and including industry in these conversations is is crucial. Getting the drugs drugs available and, uh, and accessible for the trials, getting drugs um, accessible when there is no trial, um, and getting access once. Uh, once the trials are more or less done uh, and the evidence base is there, how to get them onto, onto label and then onto formularies is the question. So then is pharma invited to these conversations and are they interested in having these conversations? I think I think the invitations, I think, have not been as as uh, strong as as they they might have been, um, uh, but I think that that's starting to change. I think I think the invitations will be going out shortly, um, and so I certainly can't say that they've been welcomed or not. Uh, it, it's we need to take the first steps. I think to uh, to really get uh, to get pharma a part of the conversation. Well, what do you think their willingness to come to the table will be? 
I think there I think there is an interest. Um, certainly, the they've demonstrated uh, a willingness to provide compassionate access to provide drugs. So certainly within uh, there are strong examples. There are examples, however, of of companies that that where where the drug is not being pursued and then and then the access is not available even if there's very strong evidence so so that that exists um but it's those conversations that we need to we need to have i wasn't suggesting that you know pharma industry is not interested in bringing the pediatric cancer drugs to canada just not entirely sure that they they know how to do that or they're aware of and, the... and, and I'm not sure there's any benefit. I you know, there if you if you look at, at the the fight and the struggle that, that they have for some products, right? For for adult indications, adding going through the, the effort for um for a, a dozen or a couple of dozen children, um I don't know that there's any 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 win for them uh, for any of this in a pathway that if the pathway isn't clear, if the pathway for adoption uh, and uptake is not not clear, I, you know, I, not sure there's there's much win. So I was going to ask, like, how do you incentivize pharma to bring drugs to Canada? But actually, I think we need to talk about how do we incentivize like the regulators and the decision makers to create this this framework this pathway yeah we we've been working on um the concept of a, of a sandbox exactly for these questions right the the current system for approving and and listing and evaluating oncology products are designed to effectively ration access in the context of adult populations. That isn't the, necessarily the objective or need for a system to evaluate and um, and approve and, and, and list products for pediatric cancer, right? Nobody wants wasted money. Nobody wa wants to take products that don't work. But the goal of, of that the evaluation system for adult cancer drugs is not necessarily the same goal um, for young people. And so as I going back to the, the idea of a sandbox is what what needs to be evaluated, what needs to be looked at and and, and provide a space where, rules and processes can be evaluated um, and with the same safety and efficacy and, and cost effectiveness objectives, but with tools that reflect the circumstances. Um, and so that would be regula like regulatory and rules and processes either at the either at the um, for supporting clinical trials, supporting uh, regulatory approval or or um, cost effectiveness evaluation. So, with the idea that you know using tools that are appropriate and 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 suited for the evaluation and the circumstances of these these drugs. And so, is that something that the access group is looking at? Yeah, the the idea predates access, um, but it's uh, the discussions are occurring there as well as as um, uh, as outside, where it will and reside so, and how will is to be determined. Yeah, looking forward to to learning more about how that rolls out. But just in terms of like the provincial, the provincial plans with their pediatric strategies, let's talk a little bit about that. It seems to be like there's well, this. Yeah, so that's a it's a question. What what do we pay attention to, right? And so your first question today is, why do we need a day or a month in September? Why do we need a day to focus our attention on, on pediatric cancer? Um, and because it's, it's different, it's treated differently, it's treated in different places. And yeah, I, I was going, recently going through trying to, trying to pull out all of the provincial um, cancer 
strategic plans or action plans or whatever. And not all of them even mention children with cancer. There, there are at least a few examples that don't even contemplate the notion that children or adolescents or, or um, even young adults will be treated for cancer. Um, I will, I will uh, allow it for New Brunswick and PEI, considering that all of the children will travel to Halifax for care. Um, but it tells you where it is and what people think of when they think of cancer care. Um, uh, some of the provinces now, some of the provinces do have um, reasonably comprehensive, at least identify the issue and 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 have have stated goals for it. Um, but you would think that uh, it would be included in all at least all, all of them would would acknowledge it. But the reality is, is that is that the. Um, the care is is delivered outside of the cancer. Um, agencies and so largely and so um, it's not a budget line item so they, there are no metrics or no KPIs for them and so it doesn't get rolled into the into the strategy. I, there's so much I want to say about that but I'm 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 going to start to wrap us up a little bit. I would like to hear a little bit, if you don't mind sharing, about your experience as a father with a child with cancer. And we don't have to get super personal, but I, I'm just wondering because you are walking into this with a, a lot of knowledge and you like you know how to navigate this, whereas a normal family, not that your family is not normal, but a, another family just wouldn't have that that knowledge or that experience or the know-how? Yeah, well, it was, it, well, I've only experienced it once and I only have, I've only experienced it with the experience that I have. Um, but I'd read a lot of uh, dr drug monographs and I'd read a lot of CADIS documents. And so being, and then spent a lot of time in the hospital, certainly in those early days. So I had a lot of stuff to read. Um, and we didn't have any drug access. We didn't really have any drug access issues. It's certainly not from a therapeutic point of view. Um, but we had an access issue for radiation services. Um, and I learned about proton radiation within a few minutes of learning the kind of tumor my son had and that it was standard of care or that certainly in the U.S. it's standard of care. And I learned moments later that there was no proton in Canada. I read I was reading a Cadeth document that had been published just two or three months previous explaining that in five or 10 years, we might invest in one, a, a, a proton facility in Canada. And so I then learned that what the provincial referral process was, and I had paperwork that, but by the time I, we met our oncologist, I had I had a, an annotated bibliography on the research. I had the CADIS documents, I had the referral paperwork, and I was able to have a conversation, probably a different conversation with the oncologist than than most families. Um, and so we went to Boston for eight weeks. He, my son was about one of 10, one, one of about 10 Ontarians um, in 2017 to, to go for proton radiation. We still don't have a facility in Canada and it isn't on the priority list of any, well, it is now on the priority list in Ontario and we're waiting a decision for building a center. And the province of British Columbia has identified it as something that needs to be examined and improved. But there are no plans for it. <laughs> and it that's frustrating. And that's a that's a therapy and, a, and that is particularly beneficial for children. And and um, particularly children under under the age of nine or eight or something like that. 
because the the effects of radiation on on developing children are profound and the Bennett mile yeah so but it's a it's a it's a service and a therapy that isn't on anybody's radar um, except for a handful of of clinicians who have been strongly supportive of the idea and um, a handful of pediatric advocates who have experience or have seen or understand what the what the benefits are so it's that's been a bit frustrating to, to pushing that rock yeah i think you'll have to come back in september so we can have a whole discussion on proton mm -hmm. therapy because working in the adult space obviously we i've never heard of it i don't know that many other people have heard of it and it i i'm sure that they would be pleasantly surprised by the benefits, especially in the pediatric space. But another thing that you said to me uh, in a conversation, not on the podcast, was uh, your experience as a father versus a mother with a child with cancer. Yeah, so most <laughs> a child or, or with cancer affects the whole family. Uh, profoundly, in most cases, the 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 responses in the family is it carries sort of predictable gender roles, um, where it's usually the mother who takes to takes responsibility for the care and the and the attendance at the hospital and all of those things, um, and the dad manages everything else basically <laughs> they they're tasked with with the rest of the kids and the any other children they have or maintaining the family and trying to trying to stay employed and all of those things um so i was it's a funny word but we were blessed through through this process for a variety of reasons um our employers provided a lot of flexibility and, and a lot of support. Uh, so I, I managed to spend about 50% of the time with my son, which is not normal. Um, I think what I, I said to you, it took a while for me to convince the, the care staff, the nurses and the mostly the nurses, um, that I knew what I was doing. But I think at the same time I got away with um, not being demanding, but I got away with with my own advocacy for my son more than women might might get away with uh, without being called difficult or boss demanding or the, I, there are a series of terms that that are commonly commonly used. Um, so yeah, there there is definitely a different. It's a different experience um, as as a father than than what I've seen uh, interacting with other with other families, what what women experience. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't know it any other way. Anybody is listening to this podcast. What is your call to action to them? Call to action. Well, to, to pay attention and to think think about children and adolescents and young adults as they're affected by cancer care. You know, we didn't talk about all of the, we talked about some of the benefits on the research side and the, and the clinic. There are lots of benefits to how, to how cancer care is provided um, uh, in Canada for uh, children, uh, but the, we need to pay attention to it. We need continued funding for, for the consortium uh, and pay attention to the consortium. That's really the call to action is if you have energy, if you have interest, get involved in the consortium. That's where the rubber is hitting the road in terms of, of um, driving change. And that's the goal. And if they wanted to get involved with the consortium, how would they do that? The, they, they do have a website. So, so uh, and, and that's the information that we'll be building up. And so the website, what I see from that access page is accessforkidscancer.ca. Is Thank that you. it? 
Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. So they they should go there if they they're interested in getting involved with the consortium. Yes. And or any or they or they can they can get involved with with us at Acorn. And where would they go for that? Acorn.com, A C two O O R N dot com. Perfect. S any last thoughts? There are many, so so I will have to come back. <laughs> I'm happy to come back and vote proton. I'm happy to come back on uh, on any number of topics on on uh, trials or or drug access. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think what I've learned is that there's a lot of work to do in the pediatric space, and we we really do need everybody to come to the table to make it happen because it's it is complicated. So. Thank you, Keith, for coming today, for educating us, and join us next time on Collab Conversations as we continue exploring the topics that are relevant today. Until then, stay curious, stay informed.